kiddos, in today's video, we're going to just real briefly cover the basics of Lewis structures. Now, what we're going to cover today is the stuff that you'll probably need for Chemistry 1. We're not going to cover the really complicated stuff. If you take some higher level classes, you'll get into that. And really, at this point, it would just sort of throw a monkey wrench into everything. So we're not going to use that. So to get started, the first thing that we need to remember how to do is to find the correct number of valence electrons for each atom. So we're going to start, um, we're going to use fluorine as our first. Now, if we go over here on the periodic table, you see the fluorine is right here. And hopefully you remember from middle school um, or from previous lessons in this class um, how to count the correct number of valence electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven valence electrons. Remember that you can also count backwards from the noble gases, this row right here, the noble gases, so you can count 8, 7, 6, 5, if that becomes a little bit easier. Remember that we're talking about S and P block stuff. We're not doing electron configurations right now, but if you add up your S and P orbitals, that also would give you that as well. So what matters for us now is that we know that we have seven valence electrons, okay, in our fluorine. So the way that we're going to draw a Lewis structure then is you draw the symbol for the element, and then you're going to put those seven valence electrons around it. Now, there is sort of a pattern for the way that you do it. You've got four sides, top, right, bottom, left. And you can't put any more than two electrons in any one of those. Again, that sort of falls back to some electron configuration stuff that we're not going to worry about. It doesn't matter so much where you start. I think sometimes people want to start at the top. And I really think that the best thing that you can do for yourself usually, and obviously those are some amazing dots. Let me go back and fix that electron. Um, I think the best thing that you can do for yourself sometimes is what I tell students a lot of times is instead of putting two at once, to put one around each side before you come back and put the second one in. So what does that mean? Well, that would mean in this case that I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You see that I ended up with the same number anyway, but that just sometimes makes it a little bit I, I think it falls a little bit more, again, with what electron configurations would be, even though we're not doing that. So that's all we would do for an atom. What would happen if we had an actual molecule? So in our case here, we're going to work this NH3. So the first thing then is to count up the number of valence electrons for each one of them. So nitrogen has five valence electrons. Again, how do I know that? One, two, three, four, five to get the nitrogen. Okay. And that's times the one nitrogen that I have, so that's five. Hydrogen each has one, and I have three of them. So in hydrogen's case, each individual hydrogen only has one, but I have three total hydrogens, and so that would give me three. We're going to add all of those up, and that would mean that I have eight valence electrons. Okay, so that's what I've got to work with here as I'm doing this. Now the question becomes, how do I arrange everything all together? Well, you got to determine what the central atom is. Usually, for most of the cases that we're going to do, it's pretty easy. If you've got one atom, uh, one of one type of atom and a bunch of the other, like we do here, we've got three hydrogens and one nitrogen, then the thing you have one of goes in the middle. Now, technically, there's some talk about electronegativity and all of that stuff. I will tell you right now that if you've got one of these elements right here, carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen, that probably goes in the middle. Carbon is definitely going to go in the middle pretty much all the time. Okay? But in general, it's pretty easy for us to tell. There's one nitrogen there, there's three hydrogens. Hydrogen's not gonna go in the middle. Okay, so we're gonna draw that out. Now, instead of doing what I did before and drawing out all of my individual electrons, I'm gonna know that I've got eight valence electrons total. And the first thing I'm gonna do is just go ahead and connect my hydrogens to my nitrogen. So the way that we do that is we put two electrons in between each one. Two electrons would represent a bond, okay, a single bond. And so what you can see right here is we've got six electrons already used up. So that means that I only have two valence electrons left. And from there, what we try to do is to make sure that we are following something called the octet rule. The octet rule says that for most atoms, except for hydrogen and helium, but that's just about it, for most atoms, you want to get to, you need to get to a state where you have eight electrons around that atom. That's called the octet rule. Atoms are most stable when they have eight electrons around them. 
That also is called noble gas electron configuration because with the exception of helium, if we went over here to our noble gases, they're all going to have eight valence electrons naturally. That's also why they're noble gases. That's why they don't react because they already have eight valence electrons. So I have two valence electrons left. Hydrogen doesn't need eight, but nitrogen does. So that means I can take those two that I had, go back over here, and now I've used all of my electrons. That's good. And then I count real quick to make sure that nitrogen is falling out One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's great. It's falling out Then what you want to do at that point is you see here that it says connect them to the central atom with a bond line. So usually once you get proficient in doing this, instead of me drawing two electrons in between them, what I would likely do in that case when I started was I would start out by drawing the bond lines that you guys are used to seeing in structural formulas. Okay, each of those bond lines is two electrons. There are two electrons that are involved in each of those bond lines. And then we would go back and make sure that the things that weren't bonds, that we did those. Okay, do not draw a line for that lone pair of electrons. We'll talk more about lone pairs and all that stuff a little bit later. Don't draw a line there. Represent those two electrons by themselves. All right, so that one was pretty straightforward, but let's. what would happen if something's a little bit more complicated, if I get a scenario where it's not as easy? So I'll tell you right now, carbon dioxide is going to be a little bit more complicated. We're going to follow the same basic rules. So we've got, I've got one carbon, okay, carbon has one, two, three, four valence electrons. So I've got four valence electrons. Then I've got two oxygens. Each oxygen has six. And so that's 12, and that means that I'm going to have a total of 16 valence electrons. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing we did last time. Carbon is going to go in the middle because I have only one of it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and draw a bond line to connect each of the things to the central atom. So my two oxygens are connected. That Each bond line, remember, takes up two electrons. So that means that I've used four electrons. I've got 12 left. E minus, that's electrons, okay? So now, I, now I'm going to go back and fill in like I normally would. I've got 12. So here's the thing. I could easily say, okay, put six around here. That makes sense. Now that oxygen has eight. That's the valence that it needs. Then I'm going to take another six over here. And so you say, hey, great. Uh, oxygen's both folly octavoral. Everything's connected. Yay, we've got it done. Um, unfortunately, though, um, we don't because carbon here only has four. Okay, so that is not going to get it done for us. So that means that we're going to have to do something a little bit different. The something that we're going to do a little bit different is I'm going to go back and just so you can see where, where we're at, that I didn't do any sort of sh shenanigans. So the original two that left us with, or four electrons, two bonds, that left us with 12. I added four here and four here, so that's another eight. So we're going to cross that out. That's going to leave us with four electrons, okay? The question might be then, how am I going to make this one stable, the oxygen? How am I going to make the carbon stable? How am I going to make this oxygen stable? Well, I've only got four electrons to go around. Well, the easiest thing, and this is almost always how this works at our level, is that we're going to draw what are called double bonds in there, okay? So those double bonds mean that instead of just one single bond with two electrons in it, there are two bonds in there that have four electrons in it. Now, double bonds are this whole other thing. There's all kinds of other things going on, but that's the important part for us, is that this now is sort of going to give us a way that we can satisfy the octet rule, that we can make sure that everything's stable um, without doing that. So just look real quick, let's make sure that we did satisfy the octet rule for this. So we've got carbon in the middle has two, four, six, eight. Great. This oxygen to the right has two, four, six, eight. Awesome. Oxygen over here left, two, four, six, eight. Remember that bonds, you don't split them. They count for each thing. They're being shared, so they each um, are able to use that. So that means that everything here has eight. We used all 16 of our electrons, and everything is connected, which is how that should be. And by the way, just as an example, um, it doesn't just have to be double bonds. We could have an N2 molecule um, that nitrogen has a triple bond between it. Okay, each nitrogen brings five valence electrons to the party which means that we've got 10 total. There's 10 there, both of them now have eight. Everything is golden and stable. 
All right, so let me let that's a little bit more complicated showing the double bonds. Let's do one uh, one more quick thing, um, just for a little bit more, just to make sure that we've got a good handle on this. So let's do this one on the left over here. This is our good friend formaldehyde, not really our good friend, but just so you know. Uh, so we've got four valence electrons here. We've got two here. That's because hydrogen has one. We got two hydrogens. We got six here. So that means I've got a total of twelve electrons that I can work with. Carbon goes in the middle. I'm going to connect everything. Okay, so everything's connected. Awesome. You notice that I use two, four, six electrons. So that means I've got six left. Obviously, I'm going to need some over here. Now, you can already tell that we'd be in the same situation we were before. If I put all six around this oxygen, then the oxygen would be stable. It would have its full octet, but the carbon would not. The carbon would still only have uh, the carbon would still only have six, which would make it unstable. So that should be our hint that there's probably a double bond there, and there is. So that gives us four left. Carbon now has its full octet. Remember, hydrogen doesn't need an octet. It just needs to be connected with the single bond. And then I've got four electrons left. So now I take those four electrons, and I'm going to put those around our good friend oxygen. Okay? So now oxygen has two, four, six, eight and that is a correct Lewis structure. Now, one more quick thing on some of the more complicated ones. Sometimes you'll see it where you're like, hey, I don't understand. So CH3 and then OH, why didn't you just make it CH4O? Wouldn't that have made a lot more sense? It would to some degree, but what this allows us to do is the fact that this OH is here, that tells us that there is a hydrogen connected to an oxygen and that that oxygen is connected to the carbon. So let me show you real quick how this works out. Let me write the electrons for each down here real quick. So four valence there, three, six, one. That's going to give us a total of 14 valence electrons for us to do this with. And so we're going to put carbon in the middle again. I'm going to start connecting H, H, H. Okay, great. Got all those. Now, here's the tricky part. This is why this OH, or what's called a hydroxyl group, is written off to the side by itself, because this is the other connection to the central atom. Now, what also has to happen is that this hydrogen here, okay, is connected to this oxygen. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that connection as well. Now, what does that mean in terms of our electrons? Well, we had 14, and now we've used 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 of them. So now I've got four electrons left, which sounds like not enough, but here's the good news. Remember, hydrogen is fine as long as it's got a single bond. Carbon already has two, four, six, eight. Oxygen has four, so that means that this oxygen then gets the other four. Now, it's unlikely you're going to see anything more complicated than that in chemistry one, maybe just a little bit, but not too difficult. So just in case you do encounter something that seems a little bit more difficult, let me give a few last minute tips just in case. Here's the thing. There is more to this than that, okay? There is more to Lewis structures than what we've done here in this video. You don't always follow the octet rule. There's what we call expanded valence. You can go higher than eight, you can go up to 12. In some rare cases, you can have that have like six electrons, okay? So it's a guideline. But for us, for our purposes in Chem 1, everything you do is gonna have the eight, um, except for the hydrogens, right? The hydrogens only have the two. Okay, that NGEC there, remember, noble gas electron configuration. So first off, make sure that everything's got the octet. If you've connected everything and everything follows the octet rule, then you're probably pretty good to go as far as this goes. Secondly, don't get too creative. Um, every year when we do bonding and stuff and students start to draw structures, they start to uh, connect things like in circles. Um, so like you'll see things like this. Okay, now, are there ring structures in nature? There absolutely are. There are tons of them. There are lots, and they're super important, particularly biologically speaking. But, but in Chem 1, we're not going to have a whole bunch of ring structures. So when you, get the, when you feel like the only way that you can get things to work is by drawing a ring, that's probably not the case, um, unless we're talking about some weird isomer structures. And again, we'll get to that momentarily. Um, and then, yeah, there's more complicated stuff. There's resonance where you might have to say, hey, Really, there's no like double bond here. There's more like a system where they're sharing the electrons throughout the whole structure. Yeah, that is absolutely the case, but not in Chem 1. We're not going to worry about that stuff this year. Um, again, if you take some advanced Chem classes, we'll get into a little bit more of that. All right, I hope that was super helpful for um, your Lewis structures. 
Um, and remember that the best way that you can really get good at this, of course, is to do some practice work some out on your own. All right, thanks, kiddos.